целью обеспечения полной безопасности людей и в первую очередь детей возникает необходимость провести временную эвакуацию жителей города и пункты Киевской области. On the 26th of April, 1986, a gigantic explosion ripped apart the fourth reactor of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in what is now Pripyat, Ukraine. The locals weren't evacuated until the next day, and by that time the radiation had already spread far and wide, deep into continental Europe. Such a terrible disaster it was that even the cameras were affected. The authorities have imposed a thousand square mile exclusion zone, where access is incredibly limited, although we do get vlogs like this once in a while. Without the presence of humans, the land has been reclaimed by the local animals, who are certainly not mutants. No one wants such an event to happen again, and countries like Italy have gotten rid of nuclear altogether. Is nuclear power really that dangerous? To answer this question, let's first look into the energy generating mechanisms of nuclear energy. The term nuclear is derived from nucleus, that is the central core of an atom, containing protons and neutrons. Protons, being positively charged, do not like being near each other, so every atom with more than one proton has a certain number of neutrons to ensure that the nucleus stays together. This worked well for smaller elements like oxygen, but things got really complicated for heavier elements like, you guess it, uranium. A uranium nucleus will always be unstable to some extent, which causes the emission of what we call radiation. One such nucleus is that of uranium-235, which has 92 protons and 143 neutrons. It mainly emits alpha radiation, which consists of nuclei containing two protons and two neutrons, along with a small amount of gamma radiation. But do you know what is interesting about uranium-235? When its nucleus is shot with a low-energy neutron, it becomes uranium-236 which is a lot more unstable and immediately disintegrates into barium-144, krypton-89 and most importantly, three neutrons. This reaction is known as fission, which releases an insane amount of energy that you can calculate using the legendary equation of E equals mc squared, made by no other than Herr Einstein himself. We'll get back to him later. Remember the neutrons? If there happens to be more uranium-235 nearby, they'll also get shot and repeat the cycle, resulting in an epic chain reaction that releases a godly amount of energy. In 1945, it was proved that by using only 64 kilograms of uranium, you could vaporize an entire city. Hopefully this will never happen again. So how do we safely harness this energy? A complete nuclear reactor needs several components to function safely, most commonly the neutron moderators and control rods. Some neutrons get so fast that they will simply just bounce off the nucleus and cause no fission at all. The mods, which can be water or graphite, grab the neutrons by the neck and force them to move slower, thereby continuing the chain reaction. But since you don't want that to be so ubiquitous, it helps to reduce the amount of circulating neutrons, which can be achieved by using rods made from neutron-absorbing materials like boron or cadmium. By changing the position of these control rods, you can adjust the rate at which the chain reaction happens. For most kinds of reactors, including the one at Chernobyl, disaster will happen if for whatever reason the chain reaction is not kept under control. In the 1986 event, the operators were conducting a test to see if the cooling systems could function properly in case of a power outage. Some key mistakes were made, including switching off the automatic control system right after it told the operators to shut the reactor down. The reactor's design itself was flawed, having what's called a positive void coefficient. Simply put, the intensity of the reaction increases as the cooling water inside boils away. When this happened, the Chernobyl operators tried lowering the control rods, in the hopes that they would stop the rapidly accelerating chain reaction. That took quite a while, after which someone realized that only the graphite tip had gone in. If you remember what I said earlier, graphite is a moderator, which means that it actually increases the rate of fission, rather than decreasing it. The rods got stuck, and by that time it was already too late. As terrible as the Chernobyl disaster was, it was an extremely unfortunate combination of bad design and human errors. It is very much possible to develop safe reactors, particularly ones that have a negative void coefficient. Unlike the Chernobyl reactor, your reaction rate will go down as the water evaporates, because in this situation water is also a moderator. Above all, it is extremely important that operators are well informed about what they are dealing with, while also making sure that safety guidelines are properly observed. This is important not just for the nuclear field, but for pretty much anything we do. 
simply forgetting to turn off your iron can destroy an entire apartment building, and don't get me started on what a cigarette can do. On the whole, nuclear power accidents have only led to the deaths of less than 10,000 people, while a coal power alone kills at least 800,000 people a year. Still, we all know that one very unpleasant thing about fission. The waste. The very radioactive waste. Take, for example, cesium-137. A sample of this thing takes three decades to shrink to half its initial amount. Singapore became a developed country in roughly the same amount of time. Extremely harmful radiation in the form of beta particles and gamma rays are emitted, making close exposure incredibly dangerous. Even the good old UV rays are no match for gamma rays. The cherry on top is cesium-137's high solubility in, you guess it, water. Water, my friend. Imagine living near a reactor, and a few grams of that thing seeped into some local stream or creek. Let's take two steps ahead. Last time I checked with Heisenberg, he told me that fission had a long lost brother that comes with the name of fusion. In case you didn't know about this, fusion is like the opposite of fission. Instead of splitting a nucleus, we smash two hydrogen nuclei together to make a helium nucleus. In that process, a tremendous amount of energy is released, which can also be calculated by E equals mc squared, with m being the difference in mass between the ingredients and the resultants. Stars like the Sun power themselves in this fashion, and so building a fusion reactor would be akin to building a mini-sun on Earth itself. For one, there would have to be an insanely high temperature, hot enough that the protons will move so fast they forget avoiding each other. And then of course, where would I get the energy to generate such a temperature? Will it even be worth the blood, sweat and tears? Even when that is settled, inside the reaction chamber would be an extremely unstable plasma soup, so while it isn't impossible, making the bowl would be an extremely tough engineering question. Since locating his brother is a bit tricky for now, let's stick with fission, who is mostly synonymous with nuclear energy, at least for now. Of course, when compared to cool stuff like solar and wind energy, fission isn't really as green. But when you consider the sheer amount of energy a nuclear reactor can generate, it isn't so bad after all, since there is virtually no carbon emissions. Not all countries have expansive plots of land to install wind turbines, and not all countries receive that much sunlight for the panels to be effective. I know, constructing the reactors can take a lot of research and money, but if your country has both of these things in great quantities, nuclear power might be a good choice to consider. Many people, some of whom I know, have a strong prejudice against nuclear power, and I think it doesn't have to be this way. This sentiment is in part due to them not understanding the concept itself, and that's why I made this video. Thank you for watching.